It was early December. The year was 1900. The new century was in full swing. Automobiles had been taking over horse-drawn wagons. Telephones had become commonplace, and electricity has been taking over upper-class communities. The Flannan Isle Lighthouse is beginning its new rotation of lighthouse keepers. They climb aboard the boat to take them off the west coast of Scotland to Ellen Moor. The lighthouse sits near its highest point. Their names are James Duckett, principal lighthouse keeper, aged 43, 28-year-old Thomas Marshall, second assistant, and 40-year-old Donald MacArthur. Occasional keeper Donald replaced the first assistant, William Ross. He was out sick. They arrived at the island to begin their work for the Northern Lighthouse Board. The lighthouse is 75 feet tall. David Stevenson designed it for the NLB. Construction started in 1895, but it wasn't finished until 1899. The light was lit for the first time on December 7, 1899. Along with the lighthouse, there is the east and west landing, along with its own cable-hauled railway, powered by a steam engine in the shed next to the lighthouse. The lighthouse keepers needed this railway to carry the oil to light the light, along with carry supplies and other provisions. The area had steep terrain. The three men settled into their new cold and rainy home until the end of their rotation. All seemed well at the lighthouse. Ships passed by and spotted the lighthouse every night. The first sign that something was wrong was December 15th. The cargo ship SS Arctur passed by on its way to Port Leith in Edinburgh. Captain Holman believed he was five miles from the lighthouse, but he couldn't see the light. He thought that he might have drifted off course. He continued on and by morning he realized he was on the right course. They must have passed by the lighthouse. He noted it in his log and he planned to report it when he reached Edinburgh. But unfortunately for the SS Arctur, disaster struck on their way into port. They ran aground off the coast of Edinburgh. The Northern Lighthouse Board did not get a report from the SS Arctur until news had already spread that James Duckett, Thomas Marshall, and Donald MacArthur were missing. The lighthouse tender Hesperus was the relief vessel and planned to sail to the Flannan Isle on December 20th. Joseph Moore was supposed to start his rotation that day and they would restock the lighthouse. But the seas were far too rough. They had to sit tight and wait it out. It was now December 26th. The seas had settled down and they set off for the Flannan Isle lighthouse. They pulled up to the landing area, but something was not right. The flag was not on the flagpole. There were no empty boxes waiting to be refilled, and the three lighthouse keepers were nowhere to be seen. This had never happened before. Captain Harvey of the Hesperus tried to call the men by blowing his horn. They waited a short time for a response, but when that failed, they fired some distress rockets, but no one came. A small rowboat was launched for the relief lighthouse keeper Joseph Moore to paddle over to the island and investigate. He exited the boat, climbed up the steep stairs, and made his way up to the summit. He passed by the ruins of the ancient chapel of St. Flannan. He decided to go in and investigate. The gate and the main door were both closed, but the kitchen door was wide open. He walked into the kitchen and then over to the fireplace. No fire was lit. But as far as he could tell, no fire had been lit for some time. The kitchen itself was neat and tidy. While Moore was inside, he noticed that every clock had not been wound. Time stood still on every one of them. He checked the bedrooms and found them all in order. He stopped his search right here and then he ran back down the hill to tell the rest of the crew of the Hesperus what he found. More men were sent up to start another search. This included Joseph Moore, second mate McCormick, and another sailor. They went to the light room and found everything in its proper place. The lamp had been cleaned after the last time it was lit. It was full of fuel and the windows were covered. But what they couldn't find was the three men. They accepted defeat and returned to the ship. Captain Harvey ordered that four men needed to stay to tend to the light while the Hesperus returned and told of their findings. The four men were Joseph Moore, Bowie Master, McDonald, Campbell, and Lamont. They spent the night settling in and also lighting the light for the first time in many nights. 
The next day, they took to searching the island for the lost men. They searched over the entire island, but couldn't find anything out of place. And that was until they reached the West Landing. There was a box that held the mooring ropes halfway up the railway, at 108 feet above sea level. The box was missing, and some of the ropes were found tangled down on the rocks by the crane. The iron railing that connected the footpath with the railway was bent over, and it was ripped out of the concrete. The iron railing for the crane was also broken. A handrail that was used for tying up boats was completely missing. A giant rock had been knocked loose and was out sitting in the open. 200 feet up the cliff, grass was ripped away as far as 33 feet from the edge of the cliff. Joseph Moore wrote a letter about these events on December 28, 1900. You can find it on the Northern Lighthouse Board's website at nlb.org.uk. .uk. As you are aware, the relief was made on the 26th. That day, as on other relief days, we came to Anchorage under Flannan Islands, and not seeing the light flag flying, we thought they did not perceive us coming. The steamer's horn was sounded several times. Still, no reply. At last, Captain Harvey deemed it prudent to lower a boat and land a man if possible. I went up, and on coming to the entrance gate, I found it closed. I made for entrance, door leading into kitchen and storeroom, found it also closed, and the door inside that, but the kitchen door itself was open. On entering the kitchen, I looked at the fireplace and saw that the fire was not lighted for some days. I then entered the rooms in succession, found the beds empty just as they left them in the early morning. I darted out and made for the landing. When I reached there, I informed Mr. McCormick that the place was deserted. Here, with some of the men, came up second time, as to make sure, but unfortunately, the first impression was only too true. On arrival, Captain Harvey ordered me back again to the island, accompanied by Mr. McDonald, buoy master, A. Campbell, and A. Lamont, who were to duty with me till timely aid should arrive. On the west side, it is somewhat different. We had an old box halfway up the railway for holding the West Landing mooring ropes and tackle. It was gone. Some of the ropes, it appeared, got washed out of it. They lined strewn on the rocks near the crane. The crane itself is safe. The iron railings along with the passage connecting railway with footpath to landing and started from their foundation and broken in several places. Also, railing round crane and handrail for making mooring rope fast for boat is entirely carried away. J. Moore, December 28, 1900. When the Hesperus arrived, they telegrammed Robert Muirhead, the Northern Lighthouse Board Superintendent. It was explained that the three lighthouse keepers were missing for possibly up to a week, and that they believed the men were either blown over the cliff or drowned in the sea trying to secure the crane. The superintendent, along with two other men, arrived on December 29th to do an official investigation. He found that the light was in good working order. He interviewed Captain Harvey along with the four men that were left behind to tend to the light. It was discovered that James Duckett had written the last entry on the slate the morning of December 15th. This entry showed that all of the work had been completed for that day. Also, all of the pots and pans had been cleaned, so whoever was on duty in the kitchen had completed their work as well. The light had been cleaned and the oil was filled, so whatever happened to the men happened the afternoon of the 15th before the light could be lit. The crew of the SS Arctur had finally told their account of passing by around midnight on the 15th and not noticing the light. They were within 5 miles of the island but could not see it. In those conditions, it should have been visible for up to 20 miles away. He investigated the West Landing and found out that what the men had told him was all true. The iron railings were bent over, the box was destroyed, and the boulder had been dislodged. He said that the damage was difficult to believe unless you actually saw it. He wrote this in his report. When the accident occurred, Duckett was wearing sea boots and a waterproof. Marshall, sea boots and oilskins. Moore assured me that the men only wore those articles when going down to the landings. They must have intended, when they left the station, either to go down to the landing or the proximity of it. 
After careful examination of the place, the railings, ropes, etc., and weighing all the evidence which I could secure, I am of the opinion that the most likely explanation of the disappearance of the men is that they had all gone down on the afternoon of Saturday the 15th of December to the proximity of the West Landing to secure the box with the mooring ropes, etc., and that an unexpected large roller had come up on the island and a large body of water going up higher than they were had swept them away with resistless force. So the superintendent believed it was a rogue wave. It must have been a massive rogue wave for it to be able to reach 200 feet up the cliff and then reach another 33 feet up the cliff beyond that, ripping away the grass. Whatever hit the men that day must have been massive. He also wrote in his report that he believed the men were not blown away. He believed that they were washed away in the sea. After the investigation, he returned home and met with the three widows of the men and told them about his findings. It is believed that Duckett and Marshall were working on the West Landing while MacArthur was still in the lighthouse. Something caused MacArthur to run out in his shirt sleeves, breaking protocol, racing down to the West Landing. The light was not supposed to be left unattended, so this was breaking policy. But of course, with all mysteries comes theories, and there are many of them in this case. Newspapers of the time printed many stories about ghosts and ghouls. One story was that a kraken or a sea serpent snatched up the men. Another theory was that the men just got tired with their lives, and they arranged for a ship to pick them up carry them off into the sunset so they could start new lives. Of course, there is zero evidence for this. Another story is that a ship filled with ghosts captured the men. In 1912, the poem Flannan Isles was written. Wilford Wilson Gibson wrote the poem, and in it he put that dinner was still left at the table and a chair had been knocked over. But we know this didn't happen. The kitchen was clean and everything was in order. The work had been completed that day after dinner. At some point, fictional log entries were reported. They have been proven fake by Mike Dash of the Fortean Times. But they tell about Marshall writing a log entry on December 12th. Severe winds, the likes of which had never been seen in 20 years. Stating also that Duckett was quiet and MacArthur was crying. December 13 talking about the men praying and the storm still raging outside. There were never any reports of a storm like this on the 12th and 13th. Plus it's been proved that these accounts were faked. Another theory is that Duckett and Marshall were working on the West Landing and MacArthur was still up in the lighthouse. He saw a massive wave coming and he rushed out to try and warn the men. It was too late and all three of them were washed into the sea. There are many different possibilities. One man could have been washed in the sea, the other two could have tried to help him, and they also could have got washed in by another rogue wave. Or MacArthur could have witnessed both men being washed away while he was still in the lighthouse, rushed down without his jacket in an attempt to save the men, but another one came and washed him away as well. There are many different possibilities. But I guess we'll never know which one really happened. Whatever happened to the three men was obviously very violent. Enough to bend steel and rip up concrete. And you have a 200 foot cliff. The grass got ripped off up a 200 foot cliff. How crazy of a wave could it be to do that? The fact that the wave was able to reach 200 feet above sea level is just astounding. I don't think it was ghosts or ghouls. I believe the most likely option is that MacArthur was in the lighthouse still and he could see either a large wave or something coming and he rushed down to try to save the two other men and then they were all washed away in the process. Whatever the case, I hope you enjoyed this one. This has been a long lasting mystery and many many people have made a video about this. It's a mystery. I love mysteries and I just wanted to go over it and talk about it. Every time I do one of these videos, I learn a ton. It's awesome. Just I went on the National Board Lighthouse website, which you should really check out. NLB.org.uk. Go check it out. It's got a ton of information. It's got the full report from the superintendent. It's got letters. It's got all sorts of stuff. So I guess I don't really know how much of a mystery it actually is because 
I believe the superintendent was correct. I mean, they saw the evidence. It's pretty obvious that something went through there, a wave or, you know, something, but I believe it was a wave. I guess that's why it's a mystery. Three men disappeared and were never found. I hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you on the next one, people. Peace.